Thank you, everybody. I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to be invited. And um, I've got a lot to cover, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. But I'm going to try to use my own clicker here. So just a second. Could you plug doesn't need batteries. It's good to go. I've got a pretty good uh, laser pointer, so I know that works. Okay, here we go. So here's a basic outline of my presentation. I'm going to start uh, with a quick overview, a timeline of um, pretty important uh, aspects of the history of rare plant conservation in the state. Then I'm going to go over the role of the California Native Plant Society and California Natural Diversity Database in rare plant conservation. I'm going to talk about how we track California rare plants in the state. And then um, what you can do for data plant conservation today if you're not already doing it. So on the timeline, in, in 1965, the California Data Plant Society was founded with a, a goal to preserve California's native flora for future generations. Three years later, the rare plant program was founded, and at this time, uh, Ledger Stebbins also began compiling a list of rare plants. And uh, in 1970, we had three major uh, legislative uh, legislations uh, enacted. We had the National Environmental Policy Act, NEPA, California Endangered Species Act, and CEQA. And then in 71, Stebbins uh, compiled his, the first list of rare plants, just over 500 plants, and these were indexed on uh, three and a half inch, uh, three by five inch note card. In 73, the Federal Endangered Species Act came around uh, three years after the California Endangered Species Act. And in 1974, the first edition of the inventory was officially published, and this contained um, nearly three times the amount of uh, Stebbins' uh, first list uh, of around 1,400 plants. In 79, a lot of big things happened for uh, the, the California uh, plant conservation. The, the Nature Conservancy was going around um, states throughout the nation and developing heritage programs in the early 70s. And by 79, um, it was officially founded in California. They were based out of the Sac State campus. And at that time, uh, CNDDB was also established. And this is when CNPS officially started sharing all of its plant data with, uh, with the CNDDB. In 1980, CMPS hired its first uh, full-time staff person, uh, rare plant botanist Rick York. And the second edition of the inventory was published later that year. And in 81, the California National Delivery States was transferred to state government. In 82, is a big uh, part of our history for uh, the CMPS uh, rare plant program and the National Diverse Database, we signed an MOU and staff became co-located and working together and sharing information across the board, um, linking our data and, and resources. Um, a few major things happened in the, from 84 to, uh, to 2001. In 86, Roxanne Bittman was hired and became the, um, the botanist for the Natural Heritage Program. And she's held that position ever since. Um, she's retired in Uitent these days, but she still is doing global and state rankings for the state. Um, which means we've had consistency in our global and state ranks throughout the history of their um, existence in the state, which is pretty big. She's done a lot for native plant conservation. Uh, four print editions were also published during that time. And uh, during the late 1990s and early 2000s, NatureServe was formed out of the Nature Conservancy. The Nature Conservancy started to do more land acquisitions and other things. And then in the early 2000s, the inventory went to an online uh, database, and there was no more print editions after 2001. And we started an internet-based review process with a forum and, and uh, reviewers. 
And in 2009, CMPS hired its first conservation program director, Greg Suba, who's here today. Um, so he's been doing a great job. For, prior to that, it was all volunteer work to get conservation, rare plant conservation going throughout the state. Um, staff that were on board would, would do some conservation when they could, but it was mostly a big volunteer effort. So it's great to have Greg at the state office. And uh, okay, picture that in your mind and remember it for the rest of my talk. <laughs> Now I'm going to go over the role of our databases um, and what we do for rare plant conservation. Um, so CMPS, or the Natural Diversity Database, assign conservation ranks to rare plants. And the rare plant program initiates the review process and adds plants, uh, California rare plant ranks, to the inventory. And we do this with your assistance to guidance. We have a public review process and um, you know, everyone can weigh in and, and, and so forth. Um, we have six different ranks to categories, uh, degrees of concern. The A category being presumed extirpated in the state, and 1B being rare in the state com uh, and elsewhere. These are, a lot of these are endemic to the state, but not, it doesn't have to be endemic. And the 2B category is rare in the state of California, but common elsewhere, could be globally common even. Three is more information needed, and four is a watch list. And then we also have uh, threat ranks that we assign to the rare plant ranks, ranging from seriously threatened to not very threatened. At the same time, while we're ranking uh, California rare plant ranks, um, uh, the Natural Heritage Program for um, California is assigning global and state heritage ranks, and they do this through the ranking calculator that Diana Hickson was talking about yesterday morning if you saw her talk. Um, so it's a nation, national wide um, standardized uh, calculator that NatureServe developed. And so they have ranks from G1, global, uh, globally rare one, to G5, and S1 to S5, meaning critically imperiled to uh, secure. So it's important to note that um, the global and state ranks are assigned at the time of the California rare plant ranks being assigned. So it really is CMPS that um, initiates new rarity status in the state of California. In other words, there's no other, you'll, you'll find no plants in the state that have an S rank, a state rank, without already having a California rare plant rank. Of course, there's other rare plant lists that exist, such as a BLM sensitive list and um, Forest Service sensitive species, which now is being newly designated as a species of conservation concern. However, these lists are often informed and developed through the rare plants that are already ranked. So I'm going to get into a little bit of discussion about how many plants we have and what this really means for conservation. Um, over one third of the state's flora is considered rare, threatened, or endangered. So if you look at the, um, the 6,500 uh, native plant taxa and growing, um, one third of that, nearly 2,400 uh, species or taxa are considered rare, threatened, or endangered. Yet only 406 of those are officially state and or federally listed. So that means we have roughly 2,000 plants that are rare, threatened, or endangered, but not state or federally listed. So this is where legislation kicks in, and it was great to have uh, Sherilyn uh, speak right before me about um, some of this legislation. Um, the NEPA, the Environmental Policy Act, and CEQA both govern, uh, require governments and public agencies to disclose environmental impacts through um, impact reports and statements. And CEQA also requires to disclose mitigation measures and project alternatives. And then they both allow for public review and comment, which is huge because it allows um, citizens and activists to actually um, influence the process in a meaningful way. And um, it does work. It doesn't always work, but it does work. So it's good. Um, CEQA goes further in that it has a clause 15380 that um, defines uh, plants that meet the definition of being rare, threatened, or endangered, um, having an equivalency of, of that status. And so the definitions of the rare plant ranks, um, the ones and twos actually fit as a requirement of this clause in CEQA, and the threes and fours um, may or should be as well, depending on um, you know, their rarity. So this allows us to protect plants that are rare in California but elsewhere, so the 2B plants. It also allows us to, to um, protect plants that are not, not necessarily rare at all, but um, uncommon. And even plants that are uh, locally rare. And as you've heard from the talks um, yesterday, even Sherilyn mentioned it, it allows for natural communities to be protected as well. So while only 406 plants are actually uh, state or federally listed, uh, these other 2,000 plants are afforded protections. 
um, through the NEPA and CEQA process. And so another way to look at this is that um, it otherwise would mean that 83% of California rare plants um, would otherwise not be protected without uh, NEPA and CEQA and the, um, and the California rare plant ranks. And if you look at this for the entire native uh, flora of the state, that means 30% of the native flora would otherwise not necessarily be protected. Now, there's other legislations and things that are out there. But the big picture here. And here's what the state looks like now with our rare plant ranks, uh, one and B and two Bs. And um, it's known for 44,000 records. And here's looking at it with um, just the state listed or federally listed plants. So this is a huge uh, amount that is um, otherwise not necessarily for the protection. So I'll talk a little bit about the tracking. Got to probably quick it up, quicken it up here. So here again, those graphs. Um, the National Diversity Database tracks occurrences, generally, and CNPS tracks and designates new rarity for plants in the state. So this uh, graph shows that there's been a steady increase in the last 10 years of occurrences of plants and animals, but uh, you know, they're both increasing as time goes on. And plotted next to a graph of um, partly of, of this reason is because there's new uh, species being added and, and continually added to the, to the list and ranked. Um, and so occurrences and rank changes are, are really tracked based on your data submissions and um, recommendations that you provide to me and, and Christy Lazar and others at um, the CNEDB. And um, it's important to note that about 1,700 of the roughly 2,400 rare plants um, are tracked and the others aren't um, just due to priority. So that's the one and two plants are tracked. Here's another graph um, that Dean Taylor has developed showing the history of uh, new discoveries and new uh, occurrence data since 1975. So this is a, a bigger picture than just a 10 year and you can see that it is steadily increasing. And occurrences can be increased uh, from field surveys or newly available data or prioritizing updates from the backlog. And here's an example from UC Merced. Um, they have proposed a, a new development project and they utilized data in the CDDB, but they found that, um, you know, oh, there's not really much sensitive plants or animals, so let's just go ahead and put, you know, the development over here or wherever we want generally. And um, you look at this 10 years later when the Native Natural Diversity Database was able to update the database and get new surveys, you can see that there's a plethora of rare plants and animals. These red polygons are um, animal occurrences, and that green are, are plants. And um, so it turns out, as um, some would presume, there's a lot of vernal pools in this area that foster rare and endangered species. So this uh, shows three valuable lessons. Um, the absence of data in the inventory and the CDB does not, uh, is not to be used to justify negative declarations. And our databases are only as good as the data received, as Sherilyn just mentioned earlier. And um, we can't protect what we don't know. So here again is that graph, and we can also increase occurrences through uh, newly described or newly discovered species. So a quick example of some newly described. Here's the Shasta Lake region and the database occurrences shown for 2009. And here it is for 2019. So if we just click that back again. And a lot of this is due to new surveys, but um, we contribute at least a good portion of this also to newly discovered plants. These are all uh, four recently described plants within three years of each other from 2013 to 2015 from the Shasta Lake region. We also uh, increase occurrences in rare plants of the state due to newly discovered species. And this plant, uh, water world grass, is the most recently added uh, plant to the inventory in the National Diversity Database. Um, it was previously known from throughout the Northern Hemisphere to be common. And um, about 10 years ago, Marlin Knight, the Klamath, Klamath National Forest, um, discovered it and we finally got it um, determined by an expert, uh, Barbara Wilson, who's here today at the Carrots Working Group. And so this was confirmed as a new plant. And um, I also want to emphasize that you know, taking photos of this and trying to send it to figure out what it is isn't going to do justice. You really need to collect vouchers. And so if she hadn't been collecting vouchers throughout the years, we would have never still discovered this, uh, got to the bottom of this one. Another plant that just came up uh, is a this uh, Allium gatorii variety tenorum that Lawrence Janeway collected in 2016 from Modoc, and um, prior to his collection, there was no other uh, records of this in the state. 
And we just got Nick Odding from the Carex Working Group again from Oregon, where this plant is more common. Um, he he uh, identified it, confirmed it. So this is inevitably going to be another 2B plant, or possibly a rank four, depending on if there's just a lot of uh, unknown uh, specimens out there that need annotation or, or new surveys. They can also be, uh, currencies can also be deleted or stopped increasing. Uh, here's a, a somewhat recent example of that, the threaded uh, gold thread. Um, it was a 2B plant, so rare in the state and common elsewhere. And we, we changed it to a watch list or a, a limited distribution in 2014. And this was mostly driven based on new occurrences being discovered. Um, in uh, 2009, we had 41 occurrences in this plant. And uh, that roughly tripled in just about five or six years. And um, we also look at trends and, and other things. We're not just looking at occurrences, but this was something that certainly instigated our uh, review to, to downrank it. So what can you do for rare plant conservation? Well, while the, uh, the increase in occurrences is steadily um, inclining throughout the state, uh, if we plot this next to the actual amount of vouchers that are being collected, um, it's in steady, steady decline. This is a, um, a gra another graph that Dean Taylor and I uh, worked on. So, first and foremost, you can collect and submit your vouchers to a participating uh, herbaria, the Consortium California herbaria. Because as you all know, um, without a voucher, it's just a rumor, and without a voucher, there's no DNA, and uh, no phylogenetic studies and other, other studies going on. Um, submit your findings, especially for um, you know, new status designations, submit them to CNPS, and new occurrence information, submit it to the databases. We can't protect what we don't know. Um, become a reviewer. I've got reviewer forms over at the CNPS table. Elizabeth uh, is over there. She can help uh, hand those out uh, if you're interested. In. It's also online, or you can just email me. Um, become a certified botanist. So actually, I, I want to ask uh, the board of certification to please stand up. I know a lot of us are in this room. Uh, Rob and Sherilyn and, and uh, Keith. Uh, so just wanted to say we have a lot of good uh, people on this board and it's, this process has been developed over the past 20 years. We really have a solid uh, uh, thing going on here. And this symposium actually counts for four professional development units, so you're already underway. And um, I think this should really be a race for what's gonna be the first firm to have all of its botanists certified in the state of California. You could take that claim to fame, you know. Um, it's wide open right now, and so I want to see, uh, see people racing to get that, that certification and get your, your institution or your, um, your firm to be certified. You can also uh, join membership or renew, donate to the Rare Plant Program or CMPS, keep the ranks alive. We rely on your uh, membership really to keep going. Um, you can get involved in the treasure hunt. Amy Patton, our new uh, treasure hunt manager, is here and has got a lot of trips lined up already. Um, you can participate in the board of plant areas or join a chapter and actually go to public forums, inform litigation, rally supporters, um, and speak at public meetings. Uh, and I'm going to leave it at that. Thanks.